going to be in the back in the book of Acts. So Pastor Terry did kind of just go along with our series. He was excited to do that. So he talked about uh, when Paul would leave Troas. So we talked about Troas, Eutychus. He falls from the third story window. So we learned the lesson there. Don't fall asleep when Pastor Brent speaks. All right? Yeah. If you follow the floor here, I don't think it's going to bother you at all. But you just might make a thud, right? Of course, Zoe, she could probably fall from anything and not get hurt, right? There's a joke. Man, there's, God was watching out over Zoe this week. So we just, on Friday there, we're very thankful that she's okay. So um, then Paul will say goodbye to the people of Troas. He makes his way along the Mediterranean Sea coast, ends up, they uh, dock in Tyre, and then they go to Caesarea. So you'll hear that here. And then they make their way to Jerusalem. So that's what we're going to talk about today and touch upon. A life surrender to God is what I've entitled the message. And we just see a little bit of who Paul is. I mean, we've been seeing who Paul is the whole time. But I think we get even below the surface a little more and just see, man, Paul was all in. He was committed. His life was totally surrendered to God's will in his life. And I think we see what that results in. Okay, we see the fruit of what happens when we give our life completely and totally to God. So let's have a word of prayer and dive in here together. Father, we thank you for this day, dear God. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to be together as the body of Christ. Lord, come and uh, just speak to us through your word. It is the living word of God. And so, Lord God, we thank you. We give you the praise. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 21 is where we're going to pick up. And so we're going to read verses 1 through 36. Yes, 1 through 36. A little bit longer passage, but we'll read through that, and then we have some points of application there. All right? You ready? So it says, After we had torn ourselves away from them, these are the people, the disciples, the church in Troas, and the NIV says torn away. It's maybe, you know, whenever the translators go from the Greek and the Hebrew into the English, there is some license there. That's why it doesn't hurt to look at a different translation. So I'm reading out the NIV. Um, if you would look at the ESV or, or in the New Living Translation. Torn is a pretty strong, intense, you know, it's kind of, oh, we're pulling away. But I think there was some of that there. So um, the idea is that they departed. There was emotion there. They were sad to see depart ways, okay? And so we put out to sea and sailed to the straight, straight to Kos. The next day we were in Rhodes, and from there we went to Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia and went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed to Syria. You realize, how many have ever been to Greece in that area, the Mediterranean Sea? It is beautiful. The seas there are just, it's beautiful. I've never been there. Okay, bucket list. Okay, but just think of, <laughs> Paul is getting to see some beautiful territory, all right? Um, as they went along. We landed at Tyre, and where our ship was unloaded, it, it was supposed to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days through the Spirit. They urged Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. Okay, this isn't the first time. We've heard that even back in Troas. And when it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us outside the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. Isn't that a beautiful picture? The church, the believers there, go with Paul out to the beach where they were going to board the ship, and they kneel on the beach to pray. I, I just think that's a pretty incredible picture, uh, just the, the closeness of relationship. I'm sure there was tears, there was hugs. Uh, there was prayer. And after saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and re they returned home. We continued on our voyage from Tyre. We landed in uh, Palamas. And there we greeted with the brothers and sisters and we stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed there at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. So have we heard of Philip before? We have. In Acts chapter 6, the church has its first major problem Greek widows are getting overlooked, and so they appoint seven people, Greek men, to help out with the distribution and ministering to the needs of these Greek widows. One of those was Philip. And so in Acts chapter 8, we see him go to Samaria. Uh, he was called the evangelist. Great things happened there. So now we see him back 
Um, back again. And now he has four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And after there was a number of days, the prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So now we're getting back into what we call Israel. And coming over to us, he took Paul's belt and he tied it with his own hands and feet and said, so he tied up Paul, he took his belt and he ties up his hands and his feet and he said, in the same way the Holy Spirit says, this is the way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand them over to the Gentiles. So again, we see that the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, there's going to be some things happening in Jerusalem that aren't going to be pleasant. Okay? And so we see they, they say, hey, don't go, right? When they heard this, we and the people pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? They're making it harder on Paul. He goes, I am ready to not only be bound, but also die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He could underline that. Highlight it. When, we would, when he would not be dissuaded, he gave up, we gave up, and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. Up to Jerusalem. Why do they say up to Jerusalem? Because... It was, it was south, or maybe kind of southeast, up because of elevation. Jerusalem's up high. And some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of um, Menanson, where we stayed, and he was a man from Cyprus. That's where Barnabas was from and one of the early disciples. Verse 17, when we arrived at Jerusalem and the brothers and sisters received us warmly, the next day Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them, reported to them in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God, and they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. So that's the thing to note there. So Christianity had spread in Jerusalem from the day of Pentecost until now. So many of these Jewish peoples are believing. The key thing to note there is that they are zealous for what? The law. And so as Paul went out, and especially his goal was to not only reach the Jews, but the Gentiles, um, circumcision was not a huge thing. But amongst the Jewish people, they saw circumcision as necessary for salvation. They held on to some of those teachings of Judaism. And so they had embraced Christ, but they also were holding on to some of the things of Judaism that uh, weren't essential to be saved. Verse 21. And so they've been informed that you teach all the Jews who live amongst the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So what do we... so we, (laughs) So do what we tell you. Okay? There are four men who are with us that have made a vow. They take these men, join in their purification rites, pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. All right? So there's purifications. They're going to shave their heads, take some vows. Then everyone will know that there's no truth in these reports about you, that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And Paul did. But verse 25, And the Gentile believers, we have written to them, our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat strangled animals, and from sexual morality. So that's a, we see that decision being made in Acts chapter 15. Verse 26, the next day Paul took the men, purified himself along with them, went to the temple to give notice of the date that the purifications would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Verse 27, when the seven days were nearly over, the Jews from province of Asia. So we know that Paul was ministering in Asia, right? He did a lot of his missionary work there in what is now Turkey. They saw Paul at the temple and stirred up the crowd. We, we saw this over and over again. They seized him shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This man teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled his holy place. Verse 29, they had previously seen Tromphias the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So it was a false accusation. Um, but anyway, 
Verse 30, the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were still trying to kill him, okay, again, we've seen this over and over, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in uproar. He at once took his officers and the soldiers ran down to the crowd and when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Verse 33, the commander came up, arrested him, ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. And some of the crowd shouted one thing, some shouted another. Since the commander could not get to the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. And when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. And the crowd that followed him kept shouting, get rid of him. Wow. There's a lot there, isn't there? There's a lot there. So what does that speak to us? Is there anything that we can gather from that that can speak to us? As Terry mentioned, it's kind of historical narrative. In other words, we're, we're getting details about Paul's journey and him coming there. There's a few things that I want to point out from verse 1 all the way to verse 36. What do we learn from Paul? First of all, we learn that Paul valued relationships. Paul valued relationships. And there's supposed to be a D on there. That's my fault. Paul valued relationships. At each place that they stop on their way, Paul would touch base with the believers there. And sometimes they stayed a day, sometimes seven, several days. But again, going back to that verses 5 and 6 and 7, they accompany him out to the beach. They kneel on the beach. They pray They say their goodbyes. They hug. He valued relationships. He could have just went all the way back to Jerusalem and not even bothered. But he loved the people. They were his spiritual father, right? Many of them had come to know Christ because of his ministry, whether directly or indirectly. They had come to know Christ. He had invested in their lives and they were valuable to him. And that has come through this story. And I think... Um, in the Christian faith, relationships are important. Um, Paul talks about this in Philippians. He just talks about the Greek word is koinonia. And sometimes you've heard that term used in the Christian language. It's kind of like somebody that's not a Christian is going to say, well, what's koinonia? Well, it's partnership and fellowship. So fellowship, yes, it is us talking together, having a meal together. But koinonia includes that but it's more than that it's more of this camaraderie that i am in this thing together with you okay kind of like you are in the military like the band of brothers right you're going to fight together for a common cause that is what we see in that word koinonia there's that partnership it's based in relationship we're in this thing together i remember talking to a pastor this was early on in my pastoral ministry up in north dakota this guy was in a little bit bigger community bigger church I uh, hadn't been there long, I don't think. Um, but his phrase, I don't know, it, we were just having this discussion. And he goes, yeah, you just build a bridge with people and then get over it. Okay, what is he saying? You, in other words, you build a relationship with people, you get accomplished your agenda, and then you move on. In other words, your agenda is more important than people. And sometimes that is a business model, isn't it? You get into the business world, relationships, and I've I've been in some of those where I was valuable to somebody as long as I helped them reach their goal. But the minute I failed to do that, who I was as a person didn't matter anymore, right? I don't see that in Paul. Paul valued people. And I think as a believer in Christ, we have different gift mixes and we have different personalities. I understand that. But I think people are important. Within the body of Christ, we see that Jesus valued people He didn't care if they were of high social status, low social status, rich or poor, whatever race. That didn't matter to Jesus. Whether they're Greek or Jew, they were all important to him, right? You read the ministry of Jesus. People mattered to him. And people mattered to Paul. And from Paul, we learn to value relationships. Amen? Secondly, we learn from Paul to lead with humility. You know, Paul was uh, an apostle, right? And he'll use that. He writes 13 letters. So if you go through your New Testament, it starts with Romans, Acts. So you get Romans and all the way there to um, 
Philemon may be the last one there. But there's 13 letters. Some are longer, some are shorter, right? And in most of them, he refers to himself as apostle, but in some of them, in three of them, he calls himself a servant of God. And a lot of times he re- appeals to his apostleship because he had to deal with issues. You read 1 Corinthians, and he had to tackle a lot of issues in that church. And so he had to kind of call on his authority as an apostle um, to deal with that. But Paul led with humility, even to the fact that he would call himself a servant of Christ. A servant of Christ. Um, You know, even when Paul went into a lot of these communities, he would not force them to support him, and often he would make tents. He was a tent maker. And so he would not be a burden upon the people. He would have outside income so that he could just focus in on um, bringing people to Christ and further in the kingdom there. This is what Paul says in Philippians 2.3. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourself. You know, so humility, right, really builds on that last principle of valuing others. We're able to lead and walk with humility when we value other people above ourselves, right? When we think we are more important than so-and-so, then that's when it can cause us issues, right? Um, Sometimes we do it intentionally. Sometimes we have no idea. We need people in our lives that help us to say, you know what, you know, you need a little more humility in your life. You know, if you need those people that speak truth into our lives, even sometimes when it hurts. Paul was a bold and confident leader. There's no doubt about that. But he also led in such a way that it embodied humility and gentleness. We see that as you read through that. We see that he has this soft and compassionate heart. He weeps with people. He prays with people. He loves on them. But he did that all with confidence and boldness as well. So humility is not weakness. Okay? Right? It's knowing who you are. And being confident in that. Because it is, when you know who you are, you can actually wash somebody else's feet and be a servant. When you don't know who you are, you need the status, you need the promotion, you need the success to validate that you are important. But when you know who you are in Christ, you can lead with humility. Um, there was a quote going on on Facebook by Matt Rule. Um, and... Um, you know, coach for Nebraska. I believe he's a God-fearing man. But he, he did say one thing. He goes, I, one thing he goes, he talked about coaching, you know, and to be a coach in Nebraska, I don't know, we probably most of us wouldn't mind the money. Um, I don't think we'd want the stress or the expectations that come with that job. Are you following me? But he, he said very clearly, he goes, I know who I am. And he was talking about his faith. It was coming through, but he goes, I know who I am. I don't need anybody else. I, he goes, I know who I am. And, and when we do that, it allows us to lead with humility, to lead with confidence and boldness in a way that glorifies God. Amen? I mean, you have to give me a little more feedback, okay? I need a little more feedback this morning. You guys are quiet. So either I'm really doing good or... Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I need to do better. All right. Number three, he valued relationships. He led with humility. And number three, he obeyed the Spirit's leading. So the Holy Spirit, through the gift of prophecy, was communicating hardship and difficulty along the way, right? Don't go, Paul, right? They're saying, don't go. Why? They didn't want Paul to get killed or injured, to be imprisoned, right? They wanted the best for Paul, right? And so as he went from place to place, the Spirit's speaking, saying, hey, this is what awaits you, Paul. And even the Agabus, you know, ties him up with his own belt and said, hey, this is what's going to happen to you in Jerusalem. And it came true, right? And so the Spirit speaking, don't go. Well, the Spirit wasn't saying don't go. This is what's going to happen. And the people said, don't go. They valued Paul. But I think that even within their own lives, they didn't, for their own benefit, they wanted Paul around longer, right? And they said, do not go. What were they asking? They were asking him, hey, disobey what God is telling you to do. Isn't that what they were doing? 
Did you know that you can have people in your life, even good people, and the Holy Spirit can speak something into our lives and, and they mean the best, but they're ask, actually asking you to disobey what God is calling you to do. Yeah, that's that, exactly, right? Peter said, hey, yeah. And Jesus says, get behind me. They knew what was coming ahead and it was confirmed over and over. Hardship awaited Paul. But listen to what he says. I believe it's in verses 13 and 14. He says, Paul answers, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's where we get to the message entitled Life Surrender to God. Paul is just wanting God's will. He doesn't care what awaits him. He wants to be in the will of God. You know, and I, I think often we want to be in the will of God as long as it means good things for our life, right? And sometimes we think when good things are happening, I'm walking in the will of God. And when bad things happen, it's kind of like, oh man, I must have messed up. But see, when Jesus went to the cross, He was in the perfect will of God. And when Paul is going to go to Jerusalem, he is in the perfect will of God. Um, and so, the people had their good intentions, but Paul had to stay true to what God had called him to do and what he had wit witnessed within his own heart. This is what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, writing to the believers that he had never met, but one day would soon would come in contact with. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. He's not saying go on the altar and put a knife into yourself. He is saying, hey, live your life as an offering to God. And sometimes it means God's going to pour out His blessing on you. Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, God has lavished His grace on us. And the words that he uses is like lavish, 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 lavish upon us. It's more than we can handle or more than we can describe. But even in the midst of all this, Paul, I think, saw God's providence. He saw God's grace. He saw God's faithfulness. And he says, I want to live my life as a living sacrifice. And I think that is our true act of worship. We worship God through our music, right? But we also worship God by how we live our life. Amen? How we live our life. And even by following the Spirit's voice. What would you have done? You're in Paul's shoes. You know that hardship is awaits you. That is, it's being confirmed and confirmed and confirmed. What would you do? Would you obey the Spirit's voice or would you obey the voice of others? They're saying, don't go. You don't have to answer. But what would you do? Yeah. That gets real, doesn't it? All right, we're on? Okay. Paul learned to value relationships, lead with humility, and obey the Spirit's leading. And I believe our goal should be to possess these qualities as well. So I want to end with, what, 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 what's the upside for living a life surrendered to God? of obeying the Spirit's voice, leading with humility, valuing relationships. Because Paul was obedient to the Spirit's leading, he got to share Christ before governors. So as we get close to finishing up the book of Acts, we'll see he goes before the governor, Felix. He goes before King Agrippa and his wife, king, recognized king of the Roman Empire. He would get to minister to countless people in Rome and many of them would come to know Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 14. He says, he goes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that what has happened to me has actually served to advance what? The gospel. Yeah. And he's talking about his imprisonment. He's writing this from prison. And so from Jerusalem, he's going to go. He eventually ends up in Rome. And he, would, uh, he appeals to Caesar to go before Caesar. And Paul doesn't want people to be sorry for him. He goes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. It hasn't been a hardship. Because Paul obeyed the Spirit's voice, the gospel is furthered even more. He says, as a result, it's become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains, not for something bad, but because... I follow Christ. Verse 14, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and are dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So two things have happened. One, the gospel has been advanced and people have heard the gospel that maybe would have never heard had not Paul gone to Rome. Number one. Number two is that the other brothers and sisters in Christ gained boldness and confidence to be bold in their own faith. If Paul can do it, maybe I can do it as well. And, and Paul's testimony would go on to some of the other church followers, that would, church followers uh, and fathers uh, that would come after him, like Polycarp. You read about Polycarp, who would be just a few years, you know, 20, 30 years later, and he would be burned at the stake, and he, would, he wasn't afraid of death. He'd be one of the bishops, and they would follow the model of Paul to live their life boldly. Um, you know what? Most of us are not going to experience the difficulties that Paul did. But this is what Paul says later in Philippians 21. He says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Um, and so Paul, he goes, You know what? I, if God took me home, I would be present with God and in his presence, Right? But, he goes, it's more fruitful that I stay so that the gospel is proclaimed. Amen. I pray that we can all possess these qualities because I believe they're essential for all of us. That as Paul, we value relationships. We lead with humility, live with humility in our life. And that we obey the Spirit's calling. God calls us all to different things. And some people would say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to die for Christ, right? If it means that I have to die for Christ. A lot of you maybe will probably never die for Christ. The question maybe then is, are you willing to live for Christ and be confident and bold? And I think for some of us, that's much harder than actually saying, I'll die for Christ. I'm going to proclaim Christ. I'm going to live my life in such a way that people can see Christ in me. Amen? I'm going to have the musicians come. And we're going to close things out. And so that's my question for you today. It's a little bit of intense message a little bit, isn't it? Um, but Paul, he challenges me because he challenges me and just sometimes Christianity and, and even in our culture can become very surface. And it can become, oh yeah, I, I, I know Christ, but it doesn't impact how I live my life. And that's not what I see in Scripture that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, it's going to impact how you live each and every moment of your every day. Um, and to live our life, the song that we're going to sing is gracefully broken. Say, God, here's my life. I want to, to be an offering to you, to bring you glory and praise. Whatever that means. It means different things from all people. For Paul, it meant going to Rome, standing trial. But in the process, man, he had a captive audience, literally. He had his guards that he got to witness to, and they couldn't go anywhere. He just got to talk to them about Christ, and many of them came to know Christ. Other prisoners that were there came to know Christ. And even he had his own rented house, and people would come and go, it says in the end of Acts, and they would come and hear the gospel, and Paul talk. Wow. What a great opportunity God gave Paul because he was obedient and he lived a life surrendered to him. Amen. Would you stand this morning?
Lord God, if we're here today and we haven't taken that first step just to make you the Lord of our life, maybe we've been in this church, maybe uh, we've heard the gospel message before, but we've never said, hey God, come into my heart and my life and be my Lord, my Savior. Today could be our day of salvation, our day that we make that happen. And so, Lord God, you said that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you are Lord, we will be saved. It's that simple. And, Lord God, um, if we make that our prayer this morning, saying, Dear God, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. Be my Lord and my Savior. You, we will be saved. That's the promise of Scripture. But, Lord, I also speak to those that... Maybe we've walked with God, maybe months, days, years. And Lord God, I I pray that you would stretch us and that we can look at the life of Paul that lived his life before us and we see so much of how he lived his life. And he lived his life gracefully broken before you, a life that was totally surrendered to your will. He lived with humility. He, He valued people. He loved people. And above all, he obeyed the Spirit's leading in his life. He wanted to do God's will. Even when good people were telling him to actually disobey God. To watch out for his own life. But he obeyed the Spirit's leading. And because of that, there was a great harvest. And the kingdom of God was advanced. And so, Lord God, stretch us this morning. By your Holy Spirit, Lord God, you can speak to each of us as as we open up our heart. I believe maybe um, one of these points maybe just touches our heart, maybe more than one or the other. Maybe all three of us are stretching us. But God, let us live our life gracefully broken. Lord God, speak to us as to how we can be more like you and more like Paul. Emulate these Christ-like virtues within our own. Lord God, we give you the thanks and the praise. Amen. So we sing this song. Would you just uh, worship the Lord and uh, just allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life? Amen. You know, just bringing it home a little bit more, what does it mean to live gracefully broken and to model that in what we see in Paul's life? Uh, It means for our young people here, we've got several young people here, part of the youth group, but it means living out your Christian faith amongst your friends. And um, we can probably all remember those days of peer pressure. And it still happens as, as adults, right? Sometimes we're even more influenced by that. But just living out our faith there. Um, um, our, probably our youngest son, Daniel, was the most open about his faith. and um, He's just a great, pleasant young man. Um, but th- there's times that... Um, it cost some relationships there because he was open about his faith. It means maybe as adults going to the neighbor across the street and just living out our faith there. Um, getting to know them, for one. And then uh, maybe just living out our faith there. Uh, I even uh, just in working with our state we have churches that are in small places that we can't get people to go to. And I, I know the challenges of rural America, right? We've pastored in a rural town up in North Dakota, 2,000 people, and it's probably less than that. I look at Fairbury. I was down there last night, so Karen is not here because she's helping out her daughter, but her daughter is the lead pastor there, came out of our church, was saved here, is now a lead pastor down there. Uh, Fairbury's a beautiful town, folks. Man, it has a beautiful park. I don't know. Economically, it's probably not as strong as Crete and things. But it's had some great pastors there. Some of our um, great pastors that have come out of Nebraska pastored there, right? Um, I'd say right now it's a little bit, I mean, but they that church sat open for two, three years or more before Amber said yes and went there. And she's doing a great job. So it can mean a lot of things. Amen. Father, this morning, go with your people. Go with us as we leave this place. And 
uh, just let us be a blessing to the world around us. Let us be salt and light. Just go with us in your presence and your power. We give you the thanks and the praise we ask in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, grab one of these or two or three. Um, Just don't let them sit on the shelf or in the car. Get them into the hands of people. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Youth group Wednesday night and Discovery Club.